Eric. Omar. Andy Galpin, welcome back to Iron Culture. Um, the, the Iron Culture Joe Rogan experience. I want to ask you a question today. Who would win in a fight, you think? A silverback gorilla or a grizzly bear? See, what I'm actually wondering is, did I screw this whole thing up? Because I feel like you guys both clapped and I didn't clap. So it's this whole thing. No, did you, I ruin the whole show? No, no, because you're you're synced up in the mind. You're synchronized. You don't need to clap. You did it spiritually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, to, to answer your question directly, I don't think either one of them win. Um, I think Eric probably beats you both. Dang. So, just hey, just as humble as I remember. Oh. Uh, Andy, here's a personal question for you. Uh, so we're, we're going to be talking about uh, you know muscle fibers. A question for you. Uh, performing a biopsy in order to assess fiber composition. I've heard through the grapevine that you performed it a few times. Out of curiosity, you or your team, how many times have you performed said biopsy? Oh, man. Oh, that number's... Well, I think we've analyzed over a million single fibers in my lab. Yeah. Um... How many actual biopsies? God, I don't know. I, I, if I had to give you a rough number, I'd probably say a thousand, maybe. <laughs> so, Andy, here's the question: I want, I want the Iron Call to know, man. So, don't bullshit me, bro, because I, I count you as a very trustworthy person. We're about to have a clinic now, all about muscle fibers. Your expertise. We're thrilled to have you back on a recurring a guest on Iron Culture. I will just say, Andy, that someone in the Iron Culture mythos offered one of us, myself and Eric, the opportunity to partake in a muscle biopsy. But I've heard through the grapevine that they could be potentially uncomfortable. Um, I just want the full scoop, if you can explain to the people what is it, what it is, the procedure, and honestly how painful it is, because I've heard conflicting things. I basically already have my prefabricated excuse that I fell down a flight of stairs the day before, so I'm good. But I just want to know, like, what is the situation here? Depends on how much of a... Mm, I mm. am. Really? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've had probably 40 on myself. Uh, in, I'm in both of my quads, in both of my patella tendons, and in my gastroc and my soleus. Um, so you're probably looking to the wrong guy to, to hear the words you want to hear right now. <laughs> uh, like... Are they super comfortable? No. Uh, in the hundreds and hundreds I've done, I've some people have been like, wow, that hurt. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but I think you would probably find like mas massage therapists that have had more complaints, you know, than I have. Sure. Uh, they don't feel good at all. It's yeah. not like, oh, that wasn't bad. It's not like, a, you know how you kind of blood draw? Yeah. And sometimes you're like, oh, I barely even felt that. Yep. Like it's never happened in the history of a biopsy. No one will ever say, I barely felt that. Like that, that'll never ever happen. <laughs> um, or with a full Bergstrom biopsy, P people do them actually kind of with, with micro biopsies, and those ones are very manageable now. Okay. Uh, most people do that. Um, so I would say, like, I don't know, like you're probably only going to have a few in your life ever. So yeah. if you think about it like that, like how bad do they hurt? Not that bad. Not really. Like we've done them. Um, I've probably had, I've already had six on in one session on myself. Uh, like we did a study way back in the day. I can't remember exactly what we did, but I feel like we did a, a quad VL biopsy, two gastroc biopsies. Then we did like 15 rounds of like 30 second uh, maximal uh, kind of interval type of things. And then we did post biopsy, the same thing. So we got six in that day. So a bunch of them. And then we've done a part of marathon and quads and stuff and, and like all kinds of stuff. So uh, you're not going to get a ton of sympathy from me. <laughs> On nice. this one, um, again, they're not like pain free at all, but you're, you're kind of like tight and sore for a few minutes, but then you can walk it off. Hey, Andy, and uh, what is worth doing in life without pain? So, Eric, you heard it from here, uh, from uh, you know, Andy himself. You don't have to worry about anything. They were talking about you getting the muscle biopsy, bro. It's gonna be nothing. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I don't remember this agreement, but I'm an agreeable man, so I will do it. You know what? <laughs> I, I can spare a little bit of quad muscle size. I, I get good feedback on my legs. It's fine. It's a micro biopsy. No, hold on. Actually, that, that's not so. micro biopsies now. Other oh, people boy. do. Micro full. I'll, I'll probably never do a micro biopsy ever. Andy, From why is that? The that we look at is oh, okay. work. Okay. Like, just methodologically, you get small chunks of tissue. 
Okay. And everything we do in my lab is single fiber based. So you have to pull all the individual fibers one by one. You can't just homogenize them all and smash them all up together. So when you do the tiny little chunks, you're getting just a bunch of garbage together. So if you were just going to smash it all up and run an assay and, and just look for, you know, some protein or enzyme count or something like that, you'd be fine. But to be able to pull the fiber out and analyze it, uh, measure the volume, things like that, and get an actual picture of where certain organelles are in the cell and things like that, it's not going to work when they're all smashed up. So we have to get bigger pieces. And for that, you guys use the, uh, the Berks, Berkstrom needle? Yeah. And how, how big is that for the listener? Um, I think it's pretty equivalent to this big. If you're watching this, um, if you just <laughs> a pen, I'm not kidding. folks, a pen, it's a pen. It's, a pen. Yeah. it's the size of a pen and there's a bevel at the end of it with a little opening. Um, so you can kind of go in there and whatever goes in that, you suction to pull the tissue into that bevel and then you have a horizontal slicer and you slice it off right there and then withdraw the entire thing or whatever's in the bevel. Can you, yeah. can you make this sound more enjoyable? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, you get a local anesthetic there, so you don't feel the incision. It, it's really weird. You don't have a lot of like specific pain receptors in the actual tissue. So you don't have this feeling of something in there, but what you have is a pressure change. Okay. Uh, so you can clearly have pressure sensor conventions. So you kind of just like, whoa, it feels like um, an instantaneous, really deep Charlie horse that goes away and literally a, a snap of a finger. You know, I think I, if you've got like yeah. a really deep muscle cramp and you're like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God and, like it's coming. Yep. But then it just never gets there. That's that's kind of like what it is because the technique I use, uh, I, I don't kind of put it in muscle and hang out for a long time like a lot of people do. I'm, I'm in and out really quick. And so it's sort of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Like, oh, okay. And then it can be a little sore afterwards. But for the most part, it's moves like, whoa, it felt like this huge cramp was coming on really intense or something like that. Um, or kind of like you, uh, you, you got a dead leg, you ran to the corner of a table really hard. But that pain doesn't stay around. Like after you hit that, you'd be like, ah, ah, like it's gone almost instantly as soon as the needle's withdrawn. So again, some people get a little sore, but for the most part, sure. not really. And then in some study designs, you do that and then you train them and then you do it again. Or at least some study designs out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, we've done more than that. So like we've done, uh, we did one study in particular where we did um, multiple resting biopsies of both legs. And then they went and did again maximal exercise and then came back immediately afterwards. We actually did one where we did three. This is crazy. Um, so we did uh, the whole bunch of, of biopsies on both legs. And then they did a, a really vigorous cycling workout. Halfway through the cycling workout, they jumped off the bike, laid on the table, we ripped the bandits off, took another biopsies, put the bandits back on. They did another half of the workout, finished and came back on and, and did another one like that. And so that, those people got a ton of biopsies, like mid maximal cycling exercise. So yeah, that's, and we don't use like, uh, we just use normal people. So everyone gets through it. I, I, we've never had anybody quit or anything like that. So the just only wait. time we've ever had a problem was actually so self-induced. <laughs> like it chuckled. We had a kid years ago. I probably shouldn't say this because the ARB is going to probably, I'm probably going to get in trouble. Whatever, man. You guys are friends. No probably, buddy. Nobody listens to this show anyways. So it's fine. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's true. true. Yeah, that's tens of thousands of people. Um, but we, we we did a study. I think this was simple. This might have been like a single resting biopsy uh, for his crypto stuff, whatever. And then he, he like came back as we normally do, checked on him. and had this big, you know, like bruise going on. And we're like, what? Oh, no. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to do like the full, you know, thing that you've never ever done that you always know what to do, you know. And I was just like, man, I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. Like, it's never happened. And he's just like, oh, it was probably from all those power planes. I was like, what? And so he was... And he showed us his technique and he was like, no, no, we work on intentionally hitting it off our five as hard as we can. So I'm like, you did a bunch of power cleans on the barbell and intentionally smashed the exact spot of the biopsy. And then like, he did it. And so the next day he came back and I was like, man, and Bruce was still gnarly. And I'm like, oh man, he's like, oh no, we did cleans again today. I was like, dude, all right, like I'm out now. Like, th like this isn't, he's like, yeah, but I put some tape on it. So it should have been fine. And, and by the way, there was so many things I want to say there. I'm like, first of all, why are we intentionally banging a barbell off our thigh for this is it? I have to, I feel like I need to have multiple conversations with you right now. And I don't want to have either one of them. So just get out of my lab. But other than that, man, we've never had they, they just don't be completely ridiculous and you'll be fine. Don't take a metal object and smash it into the biopsy site two days in a row while getting biopsies. I'm going to write that many down. Many times too. Like not like yeah. single smash, like repeated smashes. Yep. 
It's a, a power clean workout, right? Yeah, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay, okay. So I think I think we have a a visceral understanding for the listener of what is actually occurring in this research. Um, how long have has this technique using a Bergstrom needle been been around, uh, where people are getting biopsies in this manner? Oh, 60 plus years. Uh, I think it was the typical thing we'll tell people is it was reintroduced in 1962. Uh, I think is the original one. And then it's by Bergstrom. That's why it's called the Bergstrom Tech. He's actually around for a lot longer before that, but they kind of fell out of favor for whatever reasons. And then what actually is happening that you guys are history folks, so you guys will appreciate this a little bit. The, the 1950s and 60s were really wild for human performance because you had all these things coalescing. Uh, you had the launch of the American College of Sports Medicine in 1950. Dicks, I think, right? Um, the NSCA is right around the corner. You have, in the same kind of few year span, you've got Sir Edmund Hillary getting over top of Everest for his top Everest time. You got the four, Bergstrom's four minute mile. All this stuff happened in a couple of year span. At the same time, you've got all these things going on with the York Barbell uh, and everything from the perspective of um, uh, 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 Carpet and his work at Springfield and him changing and this and th- all this is happening at the exact same time. So this launches off this giant interest in human performance. A couple of years later, we've got Mr. Olympia, we've got Arnold and the whole thing. And, and the whole world that all three of us live in was created, right? But why I bring that up now is at the same time, you have the first launching of these journals of histology. And, and so you have histochemistry, the Journal of Histochemistry coming out, 1958 or something like that. And you have all these people, interest, all this interest in muscle. And so basically Bergson came and said, yo, all this stuff is in fish and whales and, and cats and stuff like that, let's start introducing histochemistry to the world of humans. Uh, now, initially that all came from cadavers and stuff. And so if you go back to all the classic anatomy stuff and even fiber type stuff they'll get into, almost all that came from cadavers. You guys would be stunned. Some of the things that you guys think are like very just basic fundamental physiology are, are really not true. And they're just really actually true from one study of six subjects that were uh, cadavers from 1958. That that's a very, very common thing that just and it just lands in a textbook and you guys know a story. Just no one ever goes backwards and like, because that actually real and comes up. So that's that's where the whole thing really took off. Uh, it was a handful of years past then go on, and then more advanced techniques started coming up, like uh, STS page electrophoresis and different um, chemistry methodologies. Gene stuff came on later in the early 90s. And that's really where things took off. Um, now you've got a bunch of different methodologies at this point to look at muscle quality and then some really, really cool stuff um, even recently. But that's the very quick version of the history of our field. Um, the the Bertram needle techniques are on for a long time. And now even um, in the last couple of years, you've got non-invasive stuff coming online. There's high throughput stuff coming online. Um, you've got imaging stuff coming online. And, and so we're going to a really good spot. It won't be anything I do probably in my career to be quite candid. But uh, I think our fundamental understanding of basic muscle structure and function will change pretty dramatically uh, in the next, call it 10 years, because we're able to solve some of the problems that have plagued us the entire history of this field. And we've never been able to get over it. And now I think we're able to do that in the blink of an eye. That's awesome to hear. Very exciting. And that's kind of the thing that science moves slow, but when it does move well, it can be really exciting to the masses and, and, and intriguing in that kind of Carl Sagan-esque way, even though we're not talking about astrophysics. Phys- physics. Um, I think with that, let's take a brief detour. And just for anyone who maybe was not around in the first year of Iron Culture, who didn't get the intro the first time, sad if they didn't stay. And probably very few people I'm talking to, but for any newcomers, could you do just do the service of, of letting people know why you know so much about this and a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. My real job is I am a professor at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, so my background, I've got a master's degree in human movement sciences and, and uh, uh, my PhD is in gene and bioenergetics. So I got that in 2011. That's a fancy way of saying muscle physiology. Um, so I've been a part of muscle biopsies. Uh, I think that I got the first one on myself in 2005, if you will. Um, did my first one, I think, in 2006, something like that. So I've been doing this uh, a decent amount of time now. Did it all through my my doctoral work. Built my lab at Cal State Fullerton in 2011. Um, so I work, and now uh, I, I co-run the Center for Sport Performance, but my specific lab is called the Biochemistry and Molecular Exercise Physiology Lab, and it is all based on these types of things. So I've been doing this for a long time. I brought the muscle biopsy to California, or the Cal State systems, 
Um, first, they're really basically only one to do that in our systems. Uh, and where I differ is, is of, I do it for the sake of human performance. So I don't do anything for obesity and disease and anything like that. It is all for human, you know, sport performance really, but human performance. So I, I do that as my full-time job and we've had good success um, in that endeavor. I also work with professional athletes and have for a long time. So right now I coach a whole bunch of professional athletes uh, that are the high profile ones here in the States. Anyways, so I'm work, we work with, you know, all pro NFL cornerbacks, quarterbacks, defensive tackles, the highest paid player in uh, the world and in four of the biggest sports in America, MVP, Cy Young winners, Hall of Famers, uh, Major League Baseball, the UFC boxing, sort of the whole thing, Olympic gold medalists, all that stuff. So we really, uh, PG Tour, uh, major winners, kind of all that stuff. So uh, I spent a little bit of time in the lab doing research. I spent a little bit of time you know, working, actually coaching professional athletes. And then I've got on the side of that, I'm involved in, we've got a number of companies. So I have a sleep company, I'm rest. We've got an education company. Um, we've got an executive health coaching company and a bunch of other things like that. So I'm a little bit industry, a little bit application and a little bit science. And it's nice collective uh, over you. Since you guys were a little bit lazy and didn't want to do that for me, I, you made me do it, but that's why. You know, you mentioned how you're involved in science, you're involved in industry and you're involved in coaching. And I think that really gives you a lot of unique insight into both the application, uh, the hard science, uh, and the practice. And that is the entire chain of research in the way I think of it. We move from a basic understanding, like basic bench research of something, to translational research to practice. And you're actually there at every step of the way, which I think is awesome. And a great overarching uh, skill set that you have, which is why I'm really honored to have you on the podcast again is that your ability to communicate it is there. And there are many coaches who are great communicating one-on-one. -on -one. They can explain to an athlete. Uh, they're good at explaining to a participant what they're going to be doing. They can, you know, operate in those three realms, but they're not necessarily able to help the lay listener who is intrigued by any one of those aspects understand it in a more complete way. And I think you do a fantastic job of that. When I want to learn more about muscle, muscle fibers and their operation and figure out like, okay, you know, in my undergrad and in my master's degree and in my PhD, I was still operating under some of those hard to die myths. If I want to get the current information, you're the person who I, who I go to your work, your YouTube channel. That's what I promote. And there's a reason for that because you're quite good. And I think that's also why you've been on some very prominent podcasts and you've done a great job with that platform. So first a kudos and a thank you. And, uh, and second, I think it would be really good for us to maybe follow this a bit sequentially. You talked about how many times uh, in science we're operating off of those burgeoning days, the beginning of when sports science became a thing, and we've got six random athletes in, in, in a quote unquote lab, and you know, hey, did you burn more carbohydrates or fat, or what, what? What happened when we cut you up? And that becomes because it was the first thing. This this kind of foundational understanding of the way the human body operates, but we are coming to understand it's relatively shaky ground. And that's not to give people a lack of faith in science, um, but more so for us to understand that it is actually challenging as we update science for us to correct the common beliefs that people have. And I think you're probably the best voice that I've seen who have been able to kind of bring people along from not being stuck in like the 90s or 80s and being like, yeah, so type 2B fibers. And you're like, you don't even have that, you know? So I, I would love to have you walk us through where we started and where we are and, and what things people often still get wrong today, despite how far the field has moved forward compared to the general layperson's understanding and why we still got S and C coaches who are like, yep, that's a fast, that's a fast athlete. That, that athlete's fast switch, you know, and really not actually knowing what they're saying or what they mean and that trickling down into kind of this malaise of, 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 of too generalized, incorrect understanding of things. Sure. Um, well, I have many hours of videos on this topic on YouTube, so I don't know how far you want me to go here <laughs> and where you want me to start. Um, maybe I'll we just... keep our podcast to five hours. No, I'm just kidding. I, I think, hey, man, I'm, I can tell you a story. One time I got invited up to my friend's place to go do a podcast, and it turned into a six series, like three to four episode hour per episode series. So be careful what you ask for. So I asked you earlier before we started when you have a hard stop. I do have a hard stop. It's multiple hours from now, so I didn't anticipate needing to bring it up. But if we can keep this to, let's say, a 20 or 30-minute overview of where we've gone as one of the most common 
uh, you know, misconceptions and, and, and where we're stuck, but where we've actually not been stuck in the literature, but we are stuck in the current uh, sports science kind of general view or fitness general view, then that would be, uh, I'll give you some constraints if that helps. I'll give you some guidance. Yeah, great. Um, just feel free to cut me off too. Uh, I think that the easiest way to start is this. Look, when we, it depends on how pedantic you really want to be. Um, if you were, for example, to go onto a field with a coach and you noticed the twitchiest, most explosive person out there fastest, there's a very good chance that person is in that and indeed faster than dog. And that, that's probably going to be real. The, the inverse is somebody who just can't move and probably slow to jump. And that, that's probably a real thing as well. So on the surface, you could say, look, we're done that. That's, that's really all we're trying to identify. Where it gets complicated is when you do things like, okay, now I'm going to alter your training or nutrition or your taper based on that. It gets far worse now when we go to, oh, okay, here, do this test, and if you score this way, you train this way. And now buy this program for fast switch people. Buy this thing. Now now we've gotten way off track. It gets even more off track when we get to the, oh, take this genetic test, and this will then tell us how to train or tell us how you are. Now we've gotten to the place where, where I'll stand up and go, hold on. Like you're way, 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 way off tilter with all this stuff. So globally, the way that you want to think about this is you've got different muscles on your body, right? Many of them, I don't know, a couple of hundred of them, right? And the way that we say this is structure equals function. And so not every muscle is organized the same way because it's not supposed to have the same function. And the very quick delineation here, take, for example, your calf muscle. And You've got multiple muscles there, but let's just focus on the two big ones, your gastroc and your soleus. Okay, now your soleus, uh, both of them, by the way, come together in your Achilles to wrap around the bottom of your foot, right? And they both there. Now the gastroc has a unique benefit of crossing the knee joint where the soleus does not. So they're not exactly the same. So you can tell by the fact that there's two of them there, they're not going to operate the exact same way. The gastroc crosses the knee joint, so it's probably going to be more involved with knee type of activities where the soleus is pretty much going to be exclusive to the ankle joint. Okay, great. Well, why does that matter? Well, when you do things like jump, that's going to require vigorous extension of the knee and the ankle. So that initially starts to tell you, okay, maybe the gastroc is more involved in things that require both knee and ankle extension, where the soleus is probably just things that revolve around ankle extension. So you think about things like walking. Well, I don't really need to extend my knee that much. Do it. It's really a foot activity. Okay. Jumping, sprinting, and you're already getting clues as to the relationship of activity. Now, when we think about the demands, the soleus is what we call anti-gravity um, or postural. And so what it means is it's there to keep you erect at all times. The soleus is to keep you from falling forward, if you will. Um, it is to do low-level activities, but to never, ever be fatigued. And um, this is why somebody who you know, stands up for five seconds and all of a sudden their feet are tired. Okay, you know, like there's a lot of things going on there. But you, but you can see the idea here. Say, okay, the soleus is fatiguing too quickly. Where somebody who has maybe no explosiveness in terms of jumping or sprinting may be an issue of the gastroc. So if you look at the soleus in humans, it is almost exclusively slow twitch. Depending on the person, it's up to 80 to 90% slow twitch, and then you know, 10 or 5%. It can even be higher. If you look at murine models and uh, rodents, things like that, they're 100 percent slow twitch in their soleus, period. That's just it, right? If you look at the gastroc, it's much more fast switch, typically not as exaggerated. Um, the hum humans are unique in the fact that we like to be really adaptable, and so we don't like to go to extremes. If we look at other animals like bears and cheetahs and things like that, they will be extreme. They will have pure fast switch and slow twitch, uh, where we will never, like very rarely, go that far. So the gastroc, if we call the soleus, rather, if we call the soleus 90% slow twitch and 10% fast switch, the gastroc is maybe on average 75% fast. 25% slow. So less aggressive in terms of specialization of the soleus, um, but the opposite direction in terms of faster profile. And so within your own body, each of your muscles or muscle groups probably has a different fiber type profile is the point I'm getting at. And you can run up and down the chain. You can take a look at the spinal erectors. Mm, so we'll speak up and on kind of all day. Got to be slow twitch. You contrast that with the hamstrings. Not doing much all day. Very, very fast twitch, right? And you could go up and down the chain and start to figure out what's going on at different muscle groups, right? Deltoid different in the traps and rhomboids and things like that. 
So within your own body, different fiber type profiles, because remember, each of those muscles is comprised of millions and millions of individual muscle fibers. There's no actual muscle there. It's a bunch of individual muscle fibers. And so they're not all the same within a muscle. We just talked about that. And they're not all the same from person to person. So if we took the soleus of all three of us right here, they're not going to be an exact profile. They, they differ, right? My, I might be 95% slow twitch there. Uh, you know, Omar, you might be 65% slow twitch. If we, call it, we, we average this all together, we'd probably average to be 90 or so percent. But the individual variation can be quite large. And now we actually know, and this is one of the major myths about fiber pipe, is that these are, pre, these are genetically determined. Well, all of your physiology has some genetic determinant. It, it, everything has a baseline, period, right? So, of course, there's genetic component. But that doesn't really mean... Um, that it's the only thing that matters. So people confuse that term of like, well, yes, they're genetically determined, but does that mean they don't change at all? That, that's not what we're saying here. And we have a enormous preponderance of evidence that muscle fiber types change. Uh, um, and I could go, I could tell you all the nutritional factors that alter fiber type. Um, I, I, I could go over, of course, exercise does it, but supplementation can alter fiber type. Uh, Phytochemicals can do it. A whole bunch of light exposure can do it. CO2 exposure can do it. Environmental toxins can do it. Everything that is possibly on or in your body has a potential to alter fiber type composition. So it is, it's beyond reproach that these are a movable target. There are still limits, right? So it doesn't matter if, if you moved any of us to the same fiber type profile as Usain Bolt. He still seems to be faster than us by a trillion miles, right? So that all you're like, well, if we're like, no, 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 come on. Because the human movement has many, many factors. Fiber type is just one of the many, many, many factors. In fact, it only explains a small percentage of variance of human performance. Because you have everything from psychology to biomechanics to panation angles to training and taper. Like, there's just so many things that go into moving fast, right? Um, the length of your foot to your Achilles, like this, this is, oh, no, no, no. So, those would be some of the big rocks that'll explain fiber type. That then said to kind of round up my last little like overarching background here. So we know that they differ um, between muscles within your own body. We know that from person to person, these things differ. And we know with absolute any question that they change your response to your lifestyle. The only other really thing then to describe here is, well, well how many types are there? And I've kind of been saying fast switch and slow switch. And if you wanted to bucket it down to that, you could. And I think you'd be, it's fine. Like that, that does pretty well describe what's going on. The reality of it is though, there are many types of, of them. So there is what we call a type one, and that is synonymous with slow. Uh, so type one is a slow twitch fiber. And then you have fast twitch fibers, but there's multiple sub profiles of fast twitch that are distinct actually, genetically distinct and, and uh, morphologically distinct. And um, so this would be a type two A and a type two X. And I could explain to you why they are name the way they are if you want but the history is interesting to me um but the reality of it is all humans have the ability to express all three of those profiles type one type 2a and type 2x type and and they are um if you were to plot a spectrum from type one all the way to type 2x and you took into account everything from size to speed to enzymatic profile, so how much mitochondria is in there, how much they use fat or carbohydrates for fuel, uh, oxidative enzymes, any of these things, singling properties, anaerobic or um, uh, sorry, anabolic potential, all of these things. It pretty much works a perfect line. So slow twitch are the slowest. Um, they tend to have the most mitochondria. They're most they use fat the most effectively, um, but they don't have a ton of anaerobic enzymes. Right, and you go to two A, and they're faster. A little more, and then you go to two X, they're even faster and more. But they have very little mitochondria. They don't use fuel, uh, uh, fat as a fuel. They have a lot of phosphocreatine, uh, but they fatigue and they break easy and things like that. But the problem is, almost never do humans actually express pure two X fibers. It's extraordinarily rare to have a pure one. Now they are common in what are called the hybrid format. So this is a single muscle fiber that is part 2A and part 2X. Um, so finding a single muscle fiber that is pure type 1 is very common. A, a muscle fiber that is pure 2A is very common. A muscle fiber that is pure 2X 
is extremely rare. And almost only in the circumstance of like a spinal cord injury and a leg hasn't been used or muscle hasn't been used in 10 plus years, something like that. Really extreme disuse or, or situations. So the whole kind of 2X thing is almost like, it's almost irrelevant to talk about in us. And in terms of like sport performance, it is basically irrelevant because it just doesn't exist. It's just it's never, ever there. And if it is, it's almost always associated with disuse, uh, being unfit things like that. And so really what I've kind of done is brought you back to really, it just does come down to one and two A. And so you can't just kind of call it fast and slow twitch from the perspective of a, of a healthy human. Um, it's really is going to come down to, to those two. A. And there's a lot more detail within all those things. So um, that's, that's my first shot at the background here. So where would you like to go next? I think that's awesome. And I think you, I really like the, how you started really high level and brought us together. Um, one of the pervasive beliefs, uh, that I see in the space is that there might be some change across a spectrum in the type two, the fast twitch fibers, but there is no, like the, the chassis are different. If you talk about type one versus type two, there's no conversion from one to the other, different motor units innervate them. Never the twain shall meet. These are, you know, to some degree, you, you, you're a fixed being in terms of if you are more type one versus type two, you can shift a little bit, but those type one fibers are never going to make the leap and vice versa. Is that an accurate view? It's not as bad, but it's almost like when someone's like, does creatine really work? I mean, is there any really research on creatine? It's like, I don't even want to answer it because I'm like, have you even tried? Have you, have you even taken that first rare look at the dozens and dozens and dozens of studies? Uh, you want to look at the human trials? Fine. You want to look at the cell culture trials? Fine. Not only do they, I could tell you the exact molecular cascade. I could tell you how much they have to be activated and what has to happen. We could go over the final chemicals that will do it. We could talk about uh, the nutrient profiles and food. This not, I get so bad. I'm like, all right, thank you. What are you really trying to say here? Um, now, having said that, I do need to acknowledge fiber typing in humans is an extremely crude uh, scientific method right now. Absolutely crude. For example, I am not aware of any way possible you could actually take a single fiber in a human, put it through some perturbation, and then actually test that exact fiber again to see if it changed. That's not possible, right? Now, in addition, one of the things we also know is extraordinarily clear. You have got millions and millions of fibers in one muscle. If I take one muscle biopsy and I pull out a couple of hundred fibers, is that really representing the entire landscape? And that's a very fair criticism. We know that the fiber profile is not the same from proximal to distal. So let's take your quad, um, the, the distinctive VL, the vastus lateralis, the outside, the lateral, most lateral quad muscle. And that kind of runs from your hip to your knee, we'll call it. When we know the fiber type profile, so the percentage of fast twitch versus slow twitch in that muscle is not the same close to your hip, not the same in the middle of the belly, it's not the same towards the knee. So where I chose to go that biopsy will change the fiber type percentage I get. The depth at which I put the needle matters. So close to the skin, you know, in the, in the belly towards the bottom of it, that will change it as well. We also know 100%, if you take multiple biopsies from the exact same incision hole, you'll get a different fiber type profile. All of these things are extremely true. And so because of that, I, I cannot 100% definitively say, yes, that individual muscle fiber itself will change its molecular profile because you're right, it has to be in the same motor unit. Everything right now suggests, for the most part, every muscle fiber in a motor unit is of the same fiber type. So the whole motor unit would have to change. So, so th th there's a gap here. There's like, well, something's not making sense. And, and it's not. This is kind of what I was saying earlier when I was alluding to, look, there's a lot of problems with this field. Um, we're making a lot of assumptions based on a, an, a like statistically 0% picture of the actual muscle fiber, right? So being able to do this stuff non-invasively and capture tens of thousands of fibers at a time, to be able to do automated stuff where we can take one biopsy and instead of, again, having to count a couple of hundred fibers, we can count tens of thousands instantaneously with software that's available now. Um, I think this is going to change a lot of things. We think a lot of things I've been screaming that are true. I'm going to probably have to come back and be like, actually, 
nope, this was an artifact of just, you know, too low sample size, basically. Um, so that all said, I cannot 100% guarantee that individual fibers will change. But if you simply look at the mountain of evidence, it is clear the global profile of the muscle is changing. How that is exactly happening, I don't know. It could be a number of things. Some of the more recent work in the area of hyperplasia is, and so, okay, maybe it's not necessarily that. Maybe it's not, I mean, it's a fiber splitting um, or it's a fiber fusion action, which could be happening as well. There could be some other things going on. So I'm less confident in, in knowing exactly that piece of it, but I'm very confident in saying, look, if you want to take this thing from the, take somebody from the, to the disuse model, put them up in space, put them in a cast, put them in bed for a long time, put them in a natural model where they just stop exercising. All of them show the same thing, right? You have a, a very dramatic change in fiber type profile. Typically, when you have conflicting results, it's because it's almost always explained 100%. And we've shown this in multiple papers now for multiple labs. Uh, at least three different labs have shown this exact same thing and published them over three different decades, by the way. So it's a very, like scientifically, that's a very strong case, right? Multiple labs over multiple time points have shown this. When you see conflicting reports, it's almost 100% explained by a, a technical methodological issue. Um, it, it is basically, they're not measuring these hybrid fibers correctly. And when they do, it is explained 100%. Um, like that, that, those would be the, the statistical numbers you'll find. It would be a 100% explanation. So uh, th that's why I'm like, really confident in that. You won't go the other direction, that's fine. You take untrained people and train them. We see it move in the opposite direction. So when it, it just fits all those lines of evidence, start showing really everything. And we're seeing it in all kinds of labs. We're seeing it in old people, young people, men, women, obesity, um, chronic heart failure. And uh, we're seeing it in um, um, our kidney failure people. And just different things. It's like, all right, guys, like, at what point do we just give up? I, well, I don't know what evidence you're looking for here that suggests you to think that they don't magically change. How will they exactly do it? I don't know. But it's very clear that they're listening. Uh, and then you follow that up with our twins research. And now it's like, okay, I gave you what you wanted. I gave you monozygous twins. Exact same DNA. All they had different was their exercise history. And their fiber type profile was markedly different. So when I held genetics 100% constant, and I did it in a, in a living human, I did it over 30 years. Like, I, I don't know what, now what are you going to say? So like in, in that particular case, by the way, we just to quickly on that one, we had uh, uh, monologous twins, non-exercisers, lifelong endurance exercise, very no lifting. The lifelong endurance exercise was in the VL was like 90% slow twitch. So like the, 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 other, the other twin was, you know, like more classic, 40% uh, slow twitch, 20% hybrid, and then the rest made up by kind of fast twitch, which is like a very textbook number we would tell you. So I don't know if all the training took the endurance guy to that level of specificity, 30 years of basically endurance running took him to 90, 95% slow twitch. Or the opposite, right? I don't know if if they were naturally there and the guy's lack of training took him down. I don't know. I can't answer that. But but at this point, who cares? It shows you it goes both directions. So like, it's gonna it's gonna go there. Now that's just thirty years. So my point is, no, maybe this doesn't happen in six weeks to a measurable level with our current technology. But if you don't think it's happening, you're in your mind. It's definitely happening. It just needs enough exposure. I love how you went in on that and made it very clear that this is a myth. I think my question for you for a brief detour on uh, education and science communication is this, why has this myth been around? Because it's something that people actually learned in the process of getting a degree in sports science in some cases, at least in certain places with old enough textbooks in certain schools. Um, this could be, maybe to some of our listeners today, I really hope not, might be something that is relatively shocking uh, and they might have, have, a, have a degree on the wall that says, you know, exercise science from somewhere university. Can you speak to that a little bit? Do you, you have thoughts on that as an educator? Yeah, I mean, I used to get really fired up about this stuff, as anyone does when they first finish their dissertation. And they're like, they're, they're, they're you know, almost pretty legitimately a world expert in some very small topic. They get really mad that the rest of the world doesn't know it's the same level they do, basically. So, like, I, I was the same way. Uh, I get less irritated about It's a combination of, of defensible and indefensible reasons. Um, look, the reality of it is I know for a hundred percent fact, there are plenty of things I teach in my classes that are probably wrong and been shown wrong for 20 years. 
It just haven't come across my radar yet. Uh, I know this, for example, I remember like maybe eight or nine years ago going in to teach a section of my like performance classes about uh, GTO inhibition and how that can, you know, change the training. And I, I remember hitting it and going, I wonder if this is like fiber type. In other words, like I just keep repeating this, but I've, I've literally never looked at a single research paper on, never, never ever done that. And I pulled it up and immediately it was like, oh, shoot. This is not right at all. Like it was, took me the first two clicks on PubMed. It was like, oh man. And so I sat there thinking, all right, do I spend weeks diving into this field and trying to learn this thing, change all my curriculum, change all my teaching, then try to get the other professors to change that stuff too, because now I'm going to be teaching something different than the rest of them. Or do I just let it fly? Don't do any of that work. And these kids still got to take certification exams. Well, that is going to be the correct answer anyways. So did I, did, I make, did I make their life worse? And I remember calling my friend and being like, yo, am I actually just making their life worse? And in the end, that's what I decided. I was just like, I'm just not going to like, I'm not going to do it. Because then I was also like, I got to do this for everything. I don't believe anything anymore. Like, I don't believe any other things I'm teaching about any part of our close as well. And I was just like, all right, I, I got to get tenure. Like I got to, I got to be life. Like I can't outdo this to myself. So. So I think part of that is like, it's, it's how would you, um, how would you keep up with cardiovascular changes? How would you, you know, when you, when you teach an exercise physiology class, you got to teach the immune system. You got to teach all these things, right? Like following, how could you really be an expert in all those fields? So I think those are defensible reasons. I, I think that's like, all right. I'm not, I know some people are in positions where it's like the fact that they are specifically told, like teach the, to the curriculum. You know, we want all of you, you're, you're, we're teaching nine sections of this class or two sections or whatever. We can't have them all. Like, and you can't. It gets really hard in the students. All right. Th those are reasonable reasons. Um, it's challenging. Second one is if you if you actually do go this, to the, to do this step, I remember reading those GTO papers and being like, man, I don't know anything about this technology. I don't know anything about this methodology or this measurement skills. Like, I don't know if they're running their stats right at all. I don't know if this is gold standard or trash. Like, I, I just didn't. And I was like, this is going to be like that. If you don't know the same thing about fiber type, you don't know what you're reading. And I've had this many times. I've seen, um, I won't say his name, but a guy in our industry, you guys would know him, who's maybe not the most reputable person. Didn't last long, although he's still probably kicking around. Published some research. Everyone immediately was like, this is very questionable. And then it wasn't, didn't take the field long to figure out. Okay. So. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah it's not hard to figure out. I remember seeing papers published on fiber type stuff, like review papers and being like, First of all, how did you let the person publish a review paper? They've never published an actual paper in this field. Never done it. And it's so clear that they don't know what they're looking at. They're just reading being like, well, all the two, two X fibers, and so they lump it in. It's like a two X fiber measured in his, uh, histochemistry is not the same as a two X fiber measured in, in the STS page. So it's not. like We know that. Like Anyone that does has ever done this one time knows that those are different measures. So like you, you, you would kind of be like saying, um, yeah, we took body composition and we just said like, you know, like all BIA and DEXA and all that. It's like, that's all the same thing. And BMI, yeah, I'll just all throw that in and make all that body fat. And I'm, you're like, all right, like undergrads know that that's not the right thing. They, and they, so you have people that are reviewing and writing review papers on these topics and writing like um, papers and like uh, research review stuff where you're like, you're so far out of your lane here. Um, and, and this is why like, you think you're coming up with this like unique and novel interpretation of what's happening, but I'm like, oh my God, like I can explain that to you in four seconds. Cause you just, you don't understand the technology or the methodology is not, but, and the fans like, how would they, it, it, it's really, really, really hard to do that. So the proper answer is people that know that stuff should be out there more, should be telling people more because they're the only ones that really do know that stuff, but that most people don't. It, 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 you know, Eric, you made a like, career out of this, but like science communication and being an active scientist is very, very challenging. And so I, I get it. Most of us are like, um, either they don't take the time to do it, have the skill set to do it, or they try and they, they, this doesn't, you got to have a logic and off point and they don't. So those are some of the reasons. That all said, um, I have seen plenty of people. I have, I get, I get these things thrown to me constantly on social media. Somebody in the field got a PhD or whatever, post something. Like content wise, they make content and I hear a 2X or a 2B thing thrown out there. 
And then I got thousand people tag me and send it over to me. And I have to be like, yo, bro, like I just happened to multiple people who like I know personally, I have to I've like send a private message like, dude, you gotta take that down. Like humans do not have two Bs. Like we, oh yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, we do this and like yeah, but then they'll pull up a paper or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, like you really don't want to do this? Like, you really don't think you want to do this? Because <laughs> we've known that answer for 30 years. Like <laughs> really definitively. So um, I guess uh, the way I say it's it's humorous. There's some humorous there. I'm <laughs> just like not wanting to look like an idiot and take your post down that you paid five hundred dollars for a graphic designer to make and yeah, yeah. spend a week. You know, like sorry, like your content is like really wrong. Maybe you don't yeah. do that. So, which again, in the wrap up, in fairness, that's probably could have happened to me a hundred times. It has. Like I know both sides. I'll post a thing and someone hit me real fast and I'll be like, oh man. So appreciate that. I don't take that down because like the actual scientist from the paper. You know, hit me up or whatever. You're like, oh man, I totally misinterpreted that. All right, great. I usually take it down, but but I get it. Or I don't sometimes. So I'm still to everybody else. No, I, I relate. And I think it's a nice, and I'll be brief on this because I think there's a lot of good stuff to touch on. But science communication is a, uh, it's constantly try not to step into a Dunning Kruger trap when you are doing it. It's, um, probably good that I have a relatively general strength conditioning sport and exercise education. Like the specific things I'm actually pretty, pretty knowledgeable at is like, you know, applications of protein because I did my master's in it. And then RPE specifically rating perceived exertion and using that to auto-regulate training. So I did my PhD in that. And then everything else, it's been something I've, uh, I've used as a, as a practitioner or touched on and I try to make sure that I know enough not to be wrong, that then I can platform people who might be right. And if it's, and then if it's, if there's any question there, I just try to stay in my lane. And it's a challenging thing in a fast moving space where you're trying to communicate on social media platforms that have a 90 second limit. Uh, and you're trying to say things that actually get people interested and hooked. And you want the clickbait to not just be clickbait and wrong and controversial, but actually to teach them something to not overstep. And I think also the personalities that are drawn to being in front of the camera sometimes have some built-in hubris. Um, and I include myself in that to some degree. Uh, there is a, a degree of arrogance, competitiveness, all these things that, that go into people who are, who are ambitious that um, you can't necessarily fully breed, nor do you really want to breed out of yourself, but you have to temper. And it's, uh, it's not easy. And I think you have to accept that you're going to get it wrong. And that's not easy for someone who's also quite perfectionist, ambitious, A-type. Um, I'm just saying I have such a hard life, Andy. Um, no, but in, but in all seriousness, um, you do a very good job with this. And now, you know, it's actually, uh, sorry to pick you up, but um, I, one thing I want to say about this is I've changed my portion perspective on this because when I initially was in the, the public space and if I had, had, if I made a mistake, I was always like, I was super embarrassed. I was like, oh my gosh, right? My opinion on this is so the opposite now. I actually use social media 100% as uh, like social testing. Yeah. If I think I've got something down, I'm like I'm pretty sure I feel really confident about this thing, right? You throw it up on social media, it, it's extremely clear really quickly if, you, if you've not thought about something, if you've missed a paper, if, if you're on the wrong. So to me, like, I, I love it. It, it. It's like having, like, you know, 200,000 reviewers. It, it's yes. the dopest way to test your stuff so fast. It's like, because when you mess something, it's like, man, you totally screwed up. This is not how this thing is used. Or this other person, you haven't seen this person's work. And you're like, no, I haven't. And then you look and I'm like, oh, man. So to me, like, I actually get super excited because if I throw something up, I get no pushback at all. I'm like, hey, eh. like, I, and I must either people aren't interested or like that, that, that idea must be tied up. Like that must, must be pretty good there. Okay, great. But if I do the opposite and all of a sudden I post something 20 minutes later, I check and all of a sudden it's just like, I'm like, oh man, all right, great. Like now I'm going to get better because I'm, I'm almost surely using the thing I posted. Almost always, right? I, I don't like, I don't, you guys see my, I don't make content. I'm not a content creator, right? I, I post screenshots of papers, right? And I do it like four in a day and then nothing for four months, whatever. Like it's, it, it's a secondary thing. If I come across something and I've got the time, like I put it up there, but there's no strategy or marketing. Like I don't do anything like that. It's just, it's, it's there. Right. So if I throw something up 
And uh, I get a ton of, of flashback on immediately. I'm like, damn, that's so like, I get so excited now. Cause I'm like, I get to not make that mistake anymore. And then I learned like, oh, there's a better way to do it. Like I read and I'm just like, man, I'm a, like almost always like when I make an Instagram post, within 24 hours, something's going back to my team. Being like, all right, we're not doing this way anymore. I definitely been screwing this one up. This is not the way to go about it. I, I think this is the wrong way to explain it. I don't, I don't think there's any more questioning this now. Like, hold up, let me go read the papers or whatever. So it's, it's the greatest way to like, I would love people work for you, basically. Bish. Wow. Omar, you put the glass of Kool-Aid in front of me. Yep. And I'm, I'm not quite ready to drink it. Yep. Even though I'd be like, I actually think there's some valid points there. Yeah. Um, so how long does it take for Kool-Aid to go bad? Because I'm not going to drink yep. it yet. But I will tell you this. You, you can't leave me hanging like this, Dad. I want to know what you're going to say. Oh, well, I'm just saying that I, there's a value in what you're saying, but I'm the type of person who doesn't want to get it wrong so bad that it's hard for me to be like, yeah, I'm going to start doing that. That would be me mm -hmm. drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, another way, okay, so it worked both ways, right? Because in your perspective, you're going to be much more careful with what you put out there. And you're going to do so much more due diligence on something than I am. So like the value is the same because you're not going to throw it up there until you've done that work. But knowing you're going to throw it up there is going to make you do the work. This is true. It's a different order. Of, yeah. Mm, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's the same thing though, right? So you're going like, yo, if this ever goes to go up, then that puts pressure on you to do more work you probably wouldn't have done. That's exactly what happens. And now you can have the glass of Kool-Aid back. I don't I, need to change. I'm already perfect. That's what I need yeah. to hear. Look, Jim Jones avoided gents. Love that portion of the conversation. We're now, Andy, we're about one hour into the conversation. And it's time to dive back at first hour of five hours back into muscle fibers. Here, correct us, Andy, because you're talking about muscle fibers. We want to get into motor units. We've spoken before on the podcast about Henneman's uh, size principle, about how motor units are recruited, let's say from the smallest to largest. Are we going about it the wrong way? However, we, we spoke about it in the context of strength, hypertrophy. Um, can you get into that a little bit? And maybe we're about to have a, a learning moment, a teachable moment where you're like, oh, more actually everything that you've heard is completely incorrect. A, B, C, D. Can, can you speak a little bit, uh, again, back now to uh, muscle fibers, motor units, and uh, maybe athletic performance? We're talking specifically about uh, Henneman's size principle. Yeah. Well, when you leave the muscle, you start to leave my expertise. This is how neat science really is at this level, right? Yep. This is a reality, right? Like, um, I, we could play the same game to you guys, too. It's like, you little thing, and you, you all of a sudden, you go, you're going, ah. So I don't have any rationale to think Henneman's size principle is not pretty correct. Um, but I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I know that the only people that I know that know that much about nerve uh, are really more neuroscientists. Um, and then they don't have any issue with it. But, the, but they're really more neuroscience, the brain and I. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. Um, now, I actually did see a paper from Trent Herta uh, yesterday. I read it. Um, a whole review paper on, on kind of like the motor unit learning thing. Uh, and he was really questioning whether or not so one of the things we say is an adaptation to strength training is um, motor unit firing rates improve. And basically his paper was like, do they really? And I was like, oh God. And so I skimmed it. I saved it on my, it's still sitting on my desktop here. I haven't gone through the whole thing. So maybe if we had to push this thing back, more days it would have. But that, I just want to know, I guess Omar, I'm, I'm like, I want to know the question that you want to know. I don't know. Like I want to read his chance paper, but like, but I, it was kind of like a teasing title, but then I don't know if he's like, actually we are right. Or whatever. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if it was right or wrong. But, uh, but you'd have to get somebody out that doesn't like neuromuscular stuff to, to really go after that stuff more. I, I don't know. Um, I would say my understanding of that stuff, with one small exception, is as cursory as, as probably anyone else with a basic, you know, undergrad degree or master's degree in, in strength conditioning or exercise physics or whatever you want to call it. Sure. And, and the reason why, uh, Andy, I brought that up, we spoke about it a few episodes ago. The way that from the onset of this conversation, we said uh, challenging some of the previously held notions some people might have in the general audience or the thing that I found intriguing that you said that you feel in 20 to 30 years from now that there will be things that we commonly hold to be true. So that's what we're, we're just discussing it before where you're like, actually, Omar, wait a second. Can you talk about that a little bit then what, what you're alluding to in regards to that? Yeah, I think it would be akin to the just within the muscle fiber stuff itself. So one of the things that's become apparent of, of late, and we, we know this actually for quite some time, but most people have realized this. So within each individual muscle fiber, so you have to remember the length of a muscle cell 
uh, is, is unorganized. And so some of them are very, very, very short and some of them are very, very long, right? You're talking literally some of them could be, you know, many, many inches long as a single cell. And this is absurdly large. Uh, human skeletal muscle is the largest cell in all of biology by volume. It is, it's absurd. It's, it's also incredibly unique that we have such nucleation. And so again, you go talk to anybody in biology and they're gonna be like, what, you have a multinucleated cell? Like, oh, I've done this a bunch. And they're like, humans have multinucleated cells? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they do. They're all multinucleated. And by multi, we need thousands and thousands of nuclei. And they're like, it's weird in biology uh, to see two nuclei in a cell. It doesn't make like, any sense, right? Because all I did is you control the cell. So the nucleus, if you're not familiar, is, is what holds your DNA. It kind of controls and tells the cell to grow, shrink, die, repair, whatever the case is. The need for adaptability in skeletal muscle and in human and all primates um, are all mammals, really. Uh, well, actually, it's all animals. So I'll go all animals, it's the same thing. Is to adapt and respond to the changing environment. And this is one of the things I argue is, is this is the primary skill set of humans that we have an advantage of is, is we're similarly more adaptable. This is our primary uh, skill. Well, in context here, what we're really saying is we have more nuclei per cell that allows us to respond to external stressors faster. Uh, you think about it this way. You're running a company and you've got one manager and then you want to open up another branch in another country. And you've got one manager trying to open up that other branch and then our branch opens up in another country. And you go, it's much more effective if you just put one manager in each one of those individual branches that have a, some of their reporting to you. This is how you build militaries and companies and stuff like that, right? Well, this is the idea. And instead of if we have these giant fibers, instead of having one manager controlling, you know, damage and insults and stimuli up and down the length of this, we're going to put thousands of them all over the place, so we're hyper responsive to whatever happens, right? Uh, to again, injury for recovery or for challenge or need or energetic demands, whatever the case may be. So we're very, very, very responsive and adaptive. What we don't have any idea though is how that that adaptive process works. And so the reality of it is learning about what are these mononuclei doing? Um, are they really limiting muscle growth? Uh, are they are they really coming in from satellite cells? Is that number fixed? Are, is it only going down? Um, how, how is that all working? Is something that we are, uh, I, I think my appraisal of that science is the consensus feels like it changes every six months, which is a sign that's like, we're, we're, no, we're not close. Like we're really, something comes down and it's like, nope, nope. No, nope, this doesn't happen at all. And then something comes out, we're like, nope, this explains all of adaptation. Then it comes back and it's like, nope. It, it, so it's like, it feels like it changes entirely every few months. So that is a thing I think we're going to learn much more about. How do these things actually respond? Uh, and which could close the gap on the thing we talked about earlier, which is missing link of like, actually, to the actual individual cells themselves change. If so, how? Does that mean they're not actually the same in the motor unit like we, we've always thought? Is it mostly true? Is it not true? Uh, I don't know. Um, the, the, I think I, I would venture to say I would be comfortable saying almost everything I've ever said in my career about fiber type, I'd be willing to let go of. And I think I, I'm, I'm fine with it because once we can get to a spot where we can analyze thousands of fibers per time point, we're, we're going to have, we're going to clearly change um, uh, conclusions. Clearly. I don't see any way around that. Um, I think we're making the decision we're making based on what we have now. Um, one quick example of this, I kind of mentioned this quickly earlier, but, you know, when we talk about muscle growth, right, now, in general, we're talking muscle hypertrophy, we're talking increase in diameter of the muscle cell, okay, this is, this is getting there, basic hypertrophy. Your only other option outside of if individual cell gets larger diameter for muscle, whole muscle growth is, of course, hyperplasia, which means you have more muscle cells. So for years, we were told that doesn't exist, despite the fact we have good evidence that it does happen in other mammals, Okay. I've always been a huge proponent. I would 100%, 100% believe hyperplasia happens in a normal human situation. I just don't think it happens very often. I think it's very small. Um, but I think it does happen over the course of 10 to 20, 30 years. I don't think it happens in six weeks. I don't think it's a first change in our adaptation training. But I think it actually happens. So then a paper came out recently showing, a couple of years ago rather, um, it's not the fact that you grow a new muscle cell, but you take an individual muscle cell you have and it splits off and branches and forms two new muscle cells. And so it's like, okay, maybe it's not hyperplasia, it's just fiber splitting and fiber branching. Okay, great. You, you add on top of that some of the stuff that Mike, uh, I mean, Mike Roberts has done with, with sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. You're like, okay, maybe there's this relationship between early adaptations or sarcoplasmic because of edema and swelling and fluids. 
but then later exchange buy more contractile proteins. And so maybe we're going to learn, maybe there is a time course thing. It's not one or the other. It is just a time course. Uh, and maybe that is different. We are starting to see now evidence come out of, well, maybe there are such things as fiber type specific hypertrophy with different styles of training. That research is conflicting. Some papers say yes, and they look at blood flow restriction stuff, and it's all the rage with type one fiber, right? And then all this other stuff says, we're not getting it. That To me, we're never answering that until we get better methodology. You're going to hundred percent get conflicting results on that. Um, I, I don't think those studies are even worth honestly paying attention to because we're looking at 50 fibers. Um, some of these fibers, 20 fibers, like it, like insanely small. And if you've ever done this work, I mean, and this is where not to get us on another tangent, this is where the scientists matter. Like I, I know there's influencers, I know there's the science communicators, but there's nothing like the actual scientists in the lab. It's a, it's just, I'm, I'm not trying to be like prestigious on anyone here. Um, there's a reason but, you're on, but like it, it, it matters when you've never actually put the ultrasound on somebody's quad. You can read all the papers you want. You're never going to be at that level of understanding what's happening because if you have, you know, if that ultrasound was a quarter of an inch in the wrong direction, entire results of your study change, right? Um, how many times you, you, you just like the control, did you really sit on the table for 15 minutes and let fluids change? Or was it 20 minutes? Did you just give and you go 12? So many factors can change the actual end result. This is why you don't trust any single paper and, and all of the, the good science interpretation you guys have spent your careers like based on. This is this is your guys' brand in large part, right? Like really understanding science and it's one of the best parts about what you guys do, right? So you guys have been over all those things. You gotta be really, really careful. Those are really good reasons. So I say that to say like, we're gonna learn some things here, but um, whether or not fiber type specific hypertrophy is the thing or not, I don't think we're gonna get answers to until we get some better technologies. And then to go even further, and this is where I think things get extremely interesting. Uh, and this is probably where I'm spending more of my time is when we start to look at some of the computational power that's coming on board. There are some very interesting things that can happen. Um, there are companies right now that are available that can do a number of things. Um, now, some of these, most of these are not commercial yet, but they are available in some of the stuff that we're working with. We can do things like take, a, take an MRI, right? And we can do an MRI, and then we can go backwards and reconstruct in three dimensions the entire muscle diameter cell thing. And so we can take serial MRIs from people, and I can I cannot just look at your VL. I can look at all of your quadricep muscles. I can do all of your hamstring muscles. I can look at your data. I can take the entire knee, uh, hip to knee and look at all of the muscles in the entire complex. Instead of really basing all the results from all these studies on a single place, on a single muscle, and maybe I had my, maybe, I, maybe one student, you know, pressed down the, the ultrasound imagery just a little bit harder than the other one, and that changed everything, right? And now we're basing these entire conclusions about this style of training works better than this style of training, right? When all we really did is said, well, well actually only in that muscle, at that exact part of the muscle. And then maybe we got crazy and we looked at it at two different sites of the muscle, but we didn't have any measurement of any of the other musculatures. And all, by the way, we all looked at muscle thickness, not cross-sectional area, not any of these other. So like we're getting, it's not to like say anything bad about this research, right? Like obviously this is my passion as well. It's just, we're limited, right? Like why? Oh, it's way too expensive. That would be way too hard. It would take forever. Okay, great. Those are all super solvable problems with, with computing right now. Like it's extremely solvable. And when the imaging stuff coming online, this stuff becomes very real. So the ability to do all your studies where you're getting a full lower half MRI, that's all being digitized, and you're getting a complete volumetric visual representation of every muscle. And now that's going to all go into very easy R programs, very easy statistical analysis, and you can get all of these things. You can get penation angle, you can get fiber length, you can get all this stuff. And yet the computation power is not hard at all, right? We're not going to throw this into NOVA anymore. It just makes no more sense. But we're writing this stuff. And now all you have to do is get a resting image of somebody. And you can do this in 100 people or 1,000 people or whatever. It's going to all be digitized. And now you're going to start getting real, real results. You don't have to worry about the, the noise getting thrown out of like, well, was that B-mode ultrasound in the right wavelength? Like, did, did you do the right resting thing? Like, it's a, you, you could put this in, in thousands of people. At the same time, so that stuff is more interesting. Um, to go on that one further, I know I'm 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 kind of in the, the weeds here. Um, with what we can do now with the digital twin, now we can start getting answers, right? And so being able to have a molecular portrait of somebody and be able to put this blueprint out there, 
taking that and then running endless simulations on it and having things come back is it, going to allow us to run tens of thousands of full experimental trials on people without wasting a single minute. Right. Well, th th this can be done instantaneously. The snap of a finger, running with, with digital cleanse, running experiments on that stuff. That's going to get us real answers. The last, last part of my battle base, the ability to put you into what we call human sensor mode, where we can take a lot of metrics on you real time. Um, we can stick uh, different things in your toilet and we can get stool samples so we can get urine samples every single time you go to the toilet. You don't do anything. It's entirely passive. We can measure brain activity with a, a ring on your finger, you do absolutely nothing. We can measure um, atmospheric stuff happening in your bedroom, the air that's going into you with the, the non-invasive sensitive path. There are chips we can put in your tooth that can measure everything going in your mouth. I can tell exactly what you ate, when you ate it, where it came from, environmental exposures. There's no more tracking and logging and participants. All this stuff goes away. And all these technologies I told you about are all available right now. And so, like, this is what I mean with, like, you know, you, know, you kind of said 10 years. It's not 10 years. It's three years. Like, it, it, it's next year. These are projects that we're, like, collecting data on now. Um, so, like, that is is fundamentally going to change uh, the entire field, in my opinion. Not just muscle fiber type, but, like, the entire field because that stuff is no longer, like, future sci-fi things, right? Uh, and we're not even getting into, of course, chat GPT and AI and stuff like that. But just the ability to model and collect with sensors um, that are so much better that allow us to just not do like, hey, undergrad, write down what you ate on a piece of paper, please, and put it in my fitness pal. And like my entire study is continued upon you tracking your calories correctly. Go on, right? Like that's just, it's just, just not high quality science, right? It's not going to be there. And then the imaging, the results testing of it, um, there are, we now have technologies where we can put full force plates into people's soles of their shoes. Right. So I don't, I don't need you to like do all these things. I'm going to actually collect force input on you 24 seven in the real world and see what you're happening. So like, there's just so much better stuff we can do. And some of the stuff that we're using with, with our athletes, um, like, I'll just say like, again, maybe summarize the, the technology is, is way, way better than what the overwhelming majority of scientists, actually scientists are using and are still getting great studies. We're still learning things that are very consistent and very good. But we're going to be able to hit the gas pedal on this stuff really quickly if people want to. The through thread there, and I think this is, you might have felt like that was a tangent or you're going in deep on this, but I actually think it connects really nicely back to some of the misconceptions around fiber type is that these misconceptions all came when there was a holding on to data from prior methods that then got eclipsed by better or complementary or methods that asked different or could ask different questions. And I was wondering if you could briefly talk about, you've, you've mentioned some of them. You said electrophoresis, and you've mentioned also some other methods of, of looking at this. It's very hard to change a perception once it exists. You know, we, we've talked about the asymmetry of, of starting a myth versus busting it on the podcast before. And I've also talked about how a lot of what we consider bro science actually starts in scientific papers and just gets outdated, repeated, and telephone gets played. So I, I think if the, if the through thread for this whole thing is that it is the methods that are so important to the communication. I think we should go there a little bit because I will say one of the litmus tests I use as a science communicator is if I can only understand the introduction, the conclusion, and maybe on a good day, the stats, but the methods are impenetrable, impenetrable to me, impenetrable to me, that's not something I should speak on. Uh, if I can't actually understand conceptually, um, how it's been done. And, 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 and it doesn't need to be crazy depth. Like I'm actually not an EMG researcher, even though I've published papers on it, but I've participated as a participant in the studies and I've talked and I understand. And, th and that's way different than me reading, you know, a biopsy paper where I've never had a biopsy on me. I've never done it. So I don't, I don't go there. And that's one of the reasons why is because that's my litmus test. And to then consider, all right, you got a master's degree, you're an influencer. You've never really, you did a master's by coursework you have good physiology, you're generally intelligent, you're a good communicator, and you're reading the introduction and the conclusion of all the papers and communicating all the things, and you're right 80% of the time to an 80% accuracy. Maybe that's a net positive, maybe it isn't, but that's a lot of misinformation as well. And I think it then amplifies some of these things that become these pervasive myths. So if you could briefly speak to just how that technology has gone from where it started created some of these misconceptions by trying to answer questions we couldn't and how we've gotten here today, I think that might be really useful and tied to that tangent. 
Yeah, sure. So if you go all the way back to the beginning of this fiber type story, uh, people realized hundreds of years ago, probably 1600s, that, man, when we start looking at dead animals, there seems to be like muscle looks different. Then you fast forward to when Anton Van Leeuwen will come online and brought up the modern day microscope, right? And then we can start looking at cells and, and this is a person who gave us these drawings. And so what you're looking at is cross sectional. So if you take a muscle fiber and you cut it in half and you look at it you know, sideways and you see all these circular shapes next to each other, what you're seeing is every individual muscle fiber. And so we started doing that in whales and different fish and stuff like that. And he started to realize, wow, okay, some of them are bigger than and some of them are smaller. And then we started looking at different muscle groups and then different animals. And we started to realize there's these red and these white fibers, right? I'm skipping a whole bunch of history here, but eventually people started saying, okay, great. There are white muscle fibers and there are red muscle fibers. Of course, now we know the red muscle fibers are red because they're slow twitch and have way more mitochondria and blood flow and things like that. And the white ones are the faster fibers. And so initially, and probably actually, uh, Omar, I think you're a little bit younger, right? But I think Eric, you and I are pretty close to the same age. So, of 40. Yeah, yeah, we're dead on. Right, same, same here. Uh, we, you probably remember, even when we were undergrads, there was still like white fibers and red fibers, right? That vernacular research. And that's why it, it came from that stuff. And that's a fine way. And so, in fact, when I was in school, we saw like, hey, there's a lot of different ways to categorize fiber types. You could do it by color. You could do it by enzymatic. So after that, people then started to realize, well, wait a minute, the white ones and the red ones have different enzymes. And so some of them are, are oxidative and glycolytic. Some of them, oh, wait, wait, looks like there's two different types of glycolytic ones. Ones that are fast glycolytic and the ones that are slower glycolytic. And so then you could call them by their enzymatic reactions, right? So FOG is fast oxidative glycolytic or, um, you know, the, 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 so there's by color, by enzymatic thing. And then people started developing the, the ability to take individual muscle fibers, put them on a force transducer. This is the force plate, kind of. Tie one end to it, put the other end of the force plate. And you soak in the bath of ATP and calcium and let the fiber contract as hard as possible. And you can measure the speed of contraction. That's what a fast twitch and a slow twitch is. And so then people started categorizing them based on their contractile properties. And that's where the name which came from. And so one of the things you'll see is extremely clear. Fiber type will not necessarily represent fiber strength, but it will represent speed. And so this is why they don't call it a fast or a strong twitch fiber or a weak twitch fiber. It is a fast twitch fiber. And so if you run the spectrum, in general, fast twitch fibers are usually larger. And usually stronger, but not always. And in fact, if you're endurance training, we've seen this tens of thousands of times, their slow twitch fibers will be bigger than their fast twitch fibers. They will be selective hypertrophy, no question about it. Now, whether it was, you know, because of the training or it was pre-selected, that's why they ran so much because they were, I don't know. But most likely, it doesn't matter. The twitch will not change them. Slow twitch fibers don't, will not be faster than fast twitch fibers. Um, now, each one of them can get faster, so you can improve contractility within the fiber itself. Um, and specific tension is, is the way we we'll do that. So, like strength per size is right there. And so, really, in the current modern day format, when we say twitch, we're referring to contractile type. We're not referring to enzymatic or color things like that. And again, all these are related, but they're not necessarily the same thing. In addition, in that sixties and seventies move, when we started bringing in histochemistry, now histochemistry is taking that fiber, slicing it looking at that cross-section and staining it with, with pH, staining with acid. And one of the things that happens, they noticed, was the, the red fibers versus the white fibers at certain pHs, some turn black and some turn white. And this is histochemistry, right? And so if you look at all the modern papers, it's like, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to look at black fibers and white fibers. And depending on if you use a low pH or high pH, fast or black or fast can be white. So not important distinction there. You can flip that, which is like very easy to figure out. Well, years go by, a few years of that, and then it's just some chemistry stuff, and people started to realize, well, wait a minute, they're not all black and white. They're like black and white, and there's a bunch of these gray ones. And then I was like, okay, great. But like the gray is typically closer to black than it is to white. And then right along the same time, we started figuring out, oh, there's these two A's and two X fibers, right? But initially, oh, screw up. All right, I'm just going to give you the, the nomenclature why we're here. All right? Sorry. going to take me a second. When we initially found this out, it was type one and type two, right? Red and white white and uh, black and white. Okay, great. Then they did this whole gray thing. 
and they figured out, well, okay, wait a minute. So there's this type one and this type two, but the type two, there's a couple of them. So we're going to call the two A and the two B. Makes sense, right? Because the two B was faster, was more fast than the other one, right? But remember, all these studies were on human. And so these were all in mice and things like that. So it's like, all right, we have type two and then type two, uh, two A and then type two B. And then more research started coming out. And then there was another type that was kind of actually in between them a little bit. And they called, started calling those type two C. Okay, great. Well, then actually we started coming online doing humans and realized, well, wait a minute, there's actually, or, sorry, they kept going and they realized there's a, there's a type two X that was even further online. I'm like, oh my God, there's this type two one. But the type two X was closer to the two A. And so now we're kind of out of order. Oh, crap. Okay. So the type 2B is actually way at the end of the spectrum because the type 2X didn't come online till later and it snuck up and it was really close to that type 2A. Hard, hard to follow, I know, but you get what I'm saying here, right? And so it's not like, why do they just call it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7? Well, this is because of the order of discovery. It's, 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 by the way, it's the exact same thing with vitamins. That's the reason we have like vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, but there's no like F and G because they were actually rediscovered as something else and they realized they weren't actual vital amino acids. And so when I came back and said, actually, those are no, no longer vital amino acids. They're not vitamins anymore. But then, um, yeah, you got to stay long because it was. And then the B vitamins, the same thing. It's like, oh, shit, there was actually a set of 12 of them. There was like 16. But if you go to the B vitamins, there's not one, two, three, four, five, six. There's missing ones. Those also were found out to be like, oh, those are actually our B vitamins. Those are um, like riboflavin, or no, uh, can't remember one of them. But anyways, yeah, they did. So that's how science happens. You get in the order of discovery. You don't go like read back into the whole system. Anyways, because then it would just be a giant mess. So. We started doing that and they started doing the work and all of a sudden we started doing the work and then the type 2B started disappearing. They're like, well, where are they all the type 2Bs? They're gone. Then we started running genetic analysis and, and started realizing, oh, humans don't even have the, the genes necessary to program for type 2B. So not only do we not have, but we don't even have the genetic coding capacity, but we have the capacity for 2X. And so that's when it actually started saying, oh, okay, okay, okay. So it looks like the three unique genetic profiles we have are for what type 1, type 2A, and type 2X. This is it. And you can make combinations of them. You can make the 2A2X hybrid. Again, this is a 2A and a 2X and a single fiber. You can have a 1 2A2X. And in fact, the reality is if you look at some of the research that take individual fibers and they fiber type them along the, end, the whole length of the fiber, it's rarely one fiber type in the whole length of the fiber. It often differs throughout the length of it, right? Which is another really challenging thing to pick up because we have a very long fiber that's say six or seven inches long. But we're taking a tiny couple of millimeters of it. You only try, you only got a little chunk of it. You may have got the chunk that was only type one, but you didn't get the chunk that was one two a or whatever, right? So um, you can also get like the, the triple hybrid, like the one two eight two x and things like that. Now the type two c then is very rare. If in fact I don't think it actually exists in, in humans, um, in adult humans, but it's neonatal. So this is something that is available around when you're you know. Uh, developing in utero, potentially even after you're born a little bit, but it's gone by the time you're you're up there. Cloud well, is, is out of the equation as well. So that leaves us now with our 1, 2A, and our 2X. But the reason 2B came along the ride is for those reasons. So anyone using that histochemistry stuff, and that just kept going on, and, and you will still find textbooks with that stuff in there. And you'll find really bad certification exams with that stuff in there, even though um, those papers came out in 1990. By the way, we knew this pretty good in like the mid 1980s and for sure, absolutely cemented. Once the genes came on board, we don't even have the genetic programs. Um, Samaritan's group came up about 1990. So like that's so long been gone that, it, that it's there. Um, so you've got the histochemistry, which is the staining thing. Now, from there, we started separately opening up another line, which is electrophoresis. So effectively what this is, is you take the muscle tissue and you put it in a vertical gel. So imagine two pieces of glass and you pour gel in between, just like hair gel, right? It's like Connect Four, but in gel. Yes, sir, it's Connect Four. And each one of the lanes in Connect Four, you put a different sample, right? So they're running vertically. You put a positive charge, electrical charge at the top of the glass. You put a negative charge or the inverse, doesn't matter, the bottom of the glass, you turn the electricity on. Well, you put those muscle samples in a chemical bath and that puts a charge on it. And so what happens is if you have a positive charge around um, the myosin heavy chain, uh, oh, this is the part of the fiber that connects the act and the mix to contract, right? You put a positive blanket around that. You put that in the cell. You put a positive charge at the top. 
You put a negative charge in the bottom. You turn that on. And you guys know what positive charges repel and negative do. So it starts running away from the top and running to the bottom. This is this is transversing top to bottom. So it's falling down. You know, it's being pulled down, pushed down, but you get it away. Well, since that gel has a consistency, bigger things go through a gel slower. Smaller things go through it faster. And so you run that gel with electricity through for a certain amount of time, typically 16, 14 to 16 hours. And then you stop it. And then you go actually, um, you, you develop it just like you develop a picture. Any of you from the old school, if, if you've ever like done an actual picture development stuff, it's the exact same thing. You put it in the bath, you shake it there, and all of a sudden this picture emerges. But basically, you use silver and you, it, it'll stain and bind those myosin heavy chains. So what effectively you're going to see is the larger myosin heavy chains, larger proteins that are associated with the faster twitch fibers are going to be higher on that gel because they won't have gone as far down and vertically. The smaller ones go get pulled down further faster, and so they're at the bottom of the gel. So now I just go to each individual lane and say, okay, are you fast or are you slow? Are you up high in the gel? You're fast. Are you down low? You're slow twitch. And then what you'll see is, let's just, I'm making this number up, but let's say there's an inch of separation between the fast twitch and the slow twitch. Well, what you'll see is there is a eighth of an inch between the 2A and the 2X. So they're right next to each other. Sometimes it's hard. If you don't really get really good clean gels, they bleed together and you can't really tell. So they're really close to each other, but the distance between 2A and 1 is very far apart. There's, there's no mistake possible there. And that just, again, really represents how close those things are. So initially what happened is they just started taking tissue samples, homogenizing them, like grinding them all up together. So we take that biopsy, pull everything out, we grind it all together, put it in that one lane of checkers, okay? And we run the whole thing down. Now, this tells us, and this is a little bit technical here, but what this tells us is we're going to see all three of these bands. So you'll see the 2X band, just below that, the 2A band, and then way below that, the type 1 band. So all three are there. But that's because you've got, you know, dozens or hundreds of fibers all smashed together. You don't know how many 1s or 2As or whatever, whatever, whatever. So what you do then is you basically say, okay, how thick is that type 1 band? How thick is that 2A band? And how thick is that 2X band? And you basically set it all to 100. And you use computer programs to do this. But you say, okay, tell me how much light, basically how dark, is that band? And if I say that added all three of them together equals 100, what percentage of the total amount of darkness is in the type 1? What percentage of the total amount of darkness is in the 2A? And then what's in the 2X, okay? That is your percentage. And it says, oh, okay, 50% of the color on this screen is coming from that type one band and 25% from 2A, 25% from 2A, then in that sample, there's a total of 50% type one. Doesn't, we don't actually know how many individual fibers are anything, but the collective representation of what's in the muscle is expressed. You guys follow me on that one? hundred percent. It totally makes sense that then you can report, hey, this muscle from this sample site is 50, 30, 20. Yeah, whatever the case is, right? That's not actually representing what's occurring in any of the individual muscle fibers. It just says in conglomerate for there. So the problem is you can't differentiate how many are in the pure form, type 1, 2A, 2A2X, hybrid, nothing like that. But you can do an entire sample in one lane. So I could take your entire biopsy, your all you know, priest before we did our training study, Boom. and I can run you in one lane. I can get eight or 12 lanes in a gel, which means I could have 12 participants run one gel and the entire analysis is done in you know, the day, day and a half. Great. Also, one could make the argument, I don't really care how many fibers are type one or type two because what's really predicting muscle function is the overall aggregate score anyways. And there is a very valid argument to that. The problem is what happens if you're trying to look for fiber type change. Yes. Now, most people don't do this. It's, it's very uncommon to be the primary outcome. But if you're trying to look for fiber type change and you had a bunch of fibers that were 2A, 2Xs, and they all transitioned to 2A, you wouldn't see anything in that homogeny because you didn't differentiate it anyways. And so this is when all those studies in the 1990s uh, and the 2000s showing like, oh, and especially in the 80s, you know, then fiber types don't change with training. It's because they were all either using histochemistry, which couldn't pick up the hybrids anyways, it was black or white, or they're using homogenous gels, 
which you can't differentiate from the fiber types that are changing anyways. We now know those hybrid fibers are far the most responsive to changes in physical activity. But since you can't measure them, they're being washed away. You know, they're moving from here to here, which means on aggregate, nothing happened. Despite the fact it was a very, very, very clear change. So you, you, this is why you'll see, um, again, depending on what methodology they use, like, oh, a change, or only with this direction. You, know, like, well, you, you can't tell anyways, because the overwhelming majority of the change is going to happen is, is going to be these fibers that are 1, 2A hybrids. And they're going to differentiate into a pure 2A. Some are going to differentiate into a pure type 1. And that's going to make those numbers look the exact same at the end. You, you can't differentiate. So along then, the next evolution was, well, what if we pull each one of these muscle fibers out one by one? And each one gets their own individual length. And I know just that. And then we look at distribution. And I can count, all right, we analyzed 400 fibers, 200 of them were type 1, 100 of them were type 2A, and 100 of them were type 2X. I can still give a percentage distribution, but I know the actual profile of each individual fiber itself. And so that gave tremendous fidelity. That came around um, uh, in the early 90s, uh, mid-90s, became really, really popular by the 2000s. It's you know, gold standard by a million miles, right? Because you can pick up everything. Here's the downside. Um, number one, remember I told you I could do the entire study in one gel with the module because I could put 12 subjects in one thing. Now I've got to run, instead of running 12 total lanes, I have to run 400 lanes per person per time point. Cost goes up, as you can do the math, right? Time goes up a ton. Um, you could again go back to the argument, well, why do you care about distribution? It's not reflecting what's actually happened in Leslie. Anyway, so, but the fidelity is here. If you want to measure the fiber type change thing, this is your, Hamad's will never get you there. But if you want to know what's actually representing muscle function, maybe Hamad is a better play if you want to do more sample size. So one of the things that happens with single fiber studies is the sample size in, of the subjects in the study gets small. Because it's, 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 it's taking months and months and months. Each one of these gels takes two days, right? And, and, and you're running 200 you're getting one person done per day, maybe, and you got multiple time points, but you got multiple vibes. So you got six months of just running gels, hoping nothing goes wrong and doesn't work. You get a monster yet, you're literally done in one day. Like, whole study's done in two days. So there's like a pretty big, like, yo, I would like to graduate. <laughs> you remember, research is done by grad students. Yep. So I got a graduate student and a master's timeline here, or I got a PhD timeline, like, Plus, there's probably other parts of your wing. I got, I'm doing a training study, or I'm doing or wings of your study. Like it's just it's, it's a lot for a student to do. That all being said, and additionally, now with homage or with um, histochemistry, the staining stuff, we started having the ability to stain for antibodies, and so now there are specific antibodies for fast twitch for two A, two A, two X things like that. So now I can go back and say, okay, instead of just giving it this like black white thing, I can use immunofluorescence and get very clear. Um, based on wavelength separation between green, red, things like that that are not confusing, not shades of gray, right? Based on antibody tagging. And because of that, I, I can do I can do a cross section, I can do hundreds of fibers at a time. And so that's another very good way to do it, um, to get distribution. Now there's problems with that as well. It's very difficult to differentiate hybrids, but now they have hybrid antibodies. So you can do those as well. Um, still some major problems there, but the major advantage is because you have the horizontal slice, you can measure diameter of the fiber itself. And so now you do, you can do account for the last piece, which I haven't unveiled yet, which is why do we care about either this homogenous or this single fiber distribution? Because neither one of them are accounting for fiber size. What is actually representing what's happening at the whole muscle level? For example, would you... Would you care, would it change things if I said you're 90% slow twitch and 10% fast twitch? But the 10% fast twitch occupy 80% of the volume of your leg. Are you a twitchy guy now or are you a slow guy now? Mm. I, I don't actually know. It will matter. It's distribution or actual relative exposure? I don't know that answer. So not accounting for fiber size is very limited. You get my point here, right? So methodologically, there's a lot of ways that that this thing can be sliced, some pros, some cons to it. But really, until you start accounting for fiber size, you're, you're probably leaving some stuff on the table. You can't really do that with single fiber SDS page. 
And unless you do what we've done, which is you pull one muscle fiber out at a time, you clip it in half. Half of it goes in the gel you fiber type. You take the other half and then you do imaging on it. Uh, and then you can actually get full diameters, measurements, stuff like that. And that's what we do for the most part, because now we can equate both sides of that equation and we can look at you know, what, what is the overall thing in the size. You combine that with some of the imaging technology and you start to understand, okay, I think this is what your muscle actually looks like. And now we can run simulations to start predicting muscle function based on that. But something just like fiber type distribution is still only going to explain some small variants of human performance, because we talked about earlier, actually, actual human performance is really multifactorial. But even just the muscle morphology itself, we haven't ever even accounted for muscle fiber size, typically in any of these studies. And so one could argue none of it matters until we account for fiber size. And that's a fairly cogent argument. 60 years and 15 minutes, Omar, is what we just got on the methodology used to inform us about different, sometimes complementary aspects of muscle fiber typing. You did an excellent job with that. I think you actually gave a good, uh, even though it was, even for people just listening, you gave them a visual. I think you painted a very good picture verbally of what's going on and how these things operate. And I think at the very least, that's going to engender some humility in people thinking about this and some openness, which I think is always a positive thing. And I think for people who are willing to take it a little bit further, it's going to help them when they start to engage with some of the discussions and maybe even the papers, if they feel so bold to jump on the PubMeds about this topic. Um, where I'd like to finish with, uh, I think maybe for the last 10 minutes or so, because we want to be respectful of your time, is let's, we, we, now we've dove into the science. Let's talk about you're a coach or you're an athlete. What do you need to know about muscle fibers to get the most out of yourself or your athletes? Or are we just not there yet? And I'm okay with either answer. Um, th that's most of the answer. There's not a lot of practical takeaway with this stuff. The one exception would be this. We have, when we did this and we took biopsies of all the, the people on the Team USA, for Olympic weightlifting. So these people on our Olympic team as well as our world team. Uh, and, and there was some pretty interesting conclusions because we got a ton of females in that study. And so this was the first study really ever high-profile female athletes looking at the female muscle physiology. It hadn't really been done before. And one of the things that was clear there is, number one, the females had just as many faster drivers as men. If you look at this on a population level and you look back at all the historical data, you will see globally women tend to be a little more slow twitch than uh, men. And, and that's a fair assessment. When you take training into account, that goes out the window. Um, and, I, and I believe that to be fundamentally true. I think, again, if you were just look at random 10,000 people and pick a country, you would typically find that was true. But when you take training in the picture, I think it goes away. Uh, I think they have equal ability to be up there. Why this really matters is the conversation about things like volume and things like taper. And, we, you know, there, there's some science in this area of like, well, maybe women, and, and you, certainly there's tons of anecdotal stuff, right? You talk to, and I've done this a lot. And basically anytime I get a, a coach that works with female athletes, I was always asked, like, wait, can they do more? Can they do less? Well, whatever, right? Just to see like what coaches are saying. And I think this is, we don't, I, don't, I don't actually have a great answer here, but I think this is something that is something worth thinking about. Um, all I can tell you is this is off the records, not scientifically calibrated thing. In that study, I did ask all the coaches, Hey, what's this person's taper look like? How much, what, what volume you Because I know those numbers, right? I, I can speak weightlifter volume. I, I know that pretty good. I know what a normal volume is or not. And if you're counting lots at 70 plus percent, like I, I'm very with at that world. So, hey, well, what's your numbers at? When do you start backing off? How do you do it and whatever? And one of the things I went, went back on afterwards was like looking at all the individual people's fiber types and thinking, Matt, I wonder if the folks who are more fast twitch do better with more taper need more taper. I don't know if it's better with or need more taper. And I wonder if the slow change folks do better with less taper. Too much taper is actually problematic. Something like that. And all I can tell you is anecdotally, it looked like that was actually a thing. And talking to coaches, they will typically say, yo, my women, just compared to my men, do more volume. Um, men respond a little bit better to intensity. Women don't need as many breaks. They don't need as much of a back off. Now, whether that, does that mean they can't handle the intensity? I don't think that's the case. I think it is the case that they just feel better when they do more volume. I think they feel better when they don't take as much of a taper. I think they perform better. So I don't think it's like a capable of like, I think it is just a like, you'll get a better response 
let me do it this way. So I don't know if that would actually be true or not, but I would imagine. Um, and the last one is when we've taken this, just because we biopsy athletes in a lot of different sports. And I can absolutely say all the ones that I biopsy, UFC fighters, stuff like that, that'll come back very slow twitch. They tend to be the ones who are just really volume people and they don't pay for much and they get sluggish and they don't feel great when they back off. Now, again, there's many, many factors in that, that learned behaviors, learned responses, told stories to themselves, told stories from coaches. Like there's all kinds of other things that go on there through. And the ones that are the, like the, the biggest fast twitchiest, they get very run down. And if you don't taper them, they just feel awful. Um, rather than the other ones. So I would be interested to see if that's actually a real thing, but I would say that is probably the closest to a takeaway thing to consider. Now, Spencer Arnold, who's the weightlifting coach, the best weightlifting coach in America, most decorated. Um, he's, he's just, it is incredible. He and I have had many conversations about this and he did change his training, uh, for three or so of his weightlifters after their biopsy results came back in. Um, change the velocity. So they do uh, in the sport of Olympic weightlifting, you, like everything is very velocity based. And, and he changed their stuff um, based on that stuff. And he felt like it gave him way better results. I didn't ask him to do that. And he called me afterwards. He's like, I took that stuff, I did this stuff, and we got way better results. So there could be something there. Um, it's not at the level where I would say, hey, if they're a fast twitch person, therefore they need to be over one little, you know, what meters per second in your training or keeping this pro. If you're going to do velocity based training or if you're using RPE stuff or uh, APRE stuff, so like, I don't know if we're there, but I would be interested to see, like, even if you did something like a fiber type estimate and then had and looked back on people and saw their auto regulation stuff, do they tend to auto regulate differently? Um, do they back off more, need more, respond better if they're more fast? I don't know. If you force me, I would, I would imagine, like, I, I say you find like a point four correlation might be point four in there. Like, that. I, I don't know if ever been stronger than that, but like that's still pretty good. Yeah, it's explain fifteen, twenty some percent percent of the variation that that ma that makes a difference. And I I love that, Andy, because I think the first thing, it, even if the main conclusion is we're not there yet, this doesn't have a whole lot of application. That gives a detector for all the people who find out. Oh, I can just do a reps to failure test at eighty percent of one RM, estimate my fiber type, and then I can do this program. And now they know. Hold on. 60 years of science still can't accurately fiber type someone in an effective way. Maybe that reps to failure test can't. Oh, and then also the assumptions baked. Yeah, sorry, buddy. Um, RIP. And then unfortunately as well, the assumptions baked into the different training protocols. We just talked about tapering there. Not tra And maybe a little more volume, a little less. Real broad strokes. So a specific training program, because I have an assumption based on an inaccurate estimate of what my fiber type is, it's 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 uh it's many steps too far and i think even if we just stop there that's a fantastic message to the listener and i think the deeper message though is that it's a time to be excited things are coming down the pipe and there are potential applications but we really can't jump ahead of our current understanding would you say that's an accurate summary yeah that is good i actually want to um like kind of push back a little bit on something um you guys may know the forces and Fatigue test. So this is a very classic exercise taught in most exercise physiology lab class. It's a leg extension test on isoconnect dynamometer. So it's called the Thorsus and fatigue test. And so you do these strictly reps of an isoconnect dynamometer. Oh, right? yeah. And then there's a prediction equation for your fiber type, right? Uh, 45, 50-year-old sort of thing. It's like a step test. It's in like, you know, very, very basic exercise class. Uh, earlier in my career, I was like, I wonder if that actually, works. I wonder if it's real. So we repeated the study, and it's not even close. Like it wasn't even close to accurate. So we sort of like threw that one out there. That that said, though, um, we did ours in pretty trained people, and his was in just a small number of people. Again, like six, three people. I think they were so trained. Uh, when I when we have done things like eighty five percent, eighty percent reps to failure things, I actually think it does like track fiber tech decently well. Oh yeah, really awesome. How how decent? Uh, like you you couldn't differentiate. Um, like hybrids or anything like that. But the reality is this. If you take an Olympic weightlifter okay. and you have them do 85% rep to fail, and then you take um, a, a soccer player. Sure. 
it's different. And if you look at the refinement type profiles, it's probably different. Let me ask you this. Do you think it'd be different between a weightlifter and a bodybuilder? That's what I was thinking. Yes. Oh, yeah. hundred yeah. percent. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because now you have training specificity. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Like that bodybuilder is going to smash out way more reps at any given percentage than that weightlifter will, right? You also see failure different. So you'll yeah. see a bodybuilder grind through their last seven reps where a weightlifter will be like, it goes up and you're like, oh man, that was super easy. And the next rep, it's like zero. 100%. What happened? It's like, you need a tire day. It's like fail, like total fail, right? Um, you can see videos of that, but I would say that's absolutely like a real thing, right? So I don't think those anecdotes we're talking about, we're talking about like actually saying a bunch of athletes over my life. So I think that would be there. So I actually do think it's not like the worst crude metric ever of getting close to somebody. Whether is it your fiber type, I don't know. Is, is it an indicator though? Are you like a pretty good muscular endurance person? Are you very poor muscular endurance person? I think, yeah, it, it's sure. It's going to tell you that for sure. And if you are typically used to doing reps in the, you know, ones to threes, I, I don't anticipate doing very well on a set that's going to test you to like do 12s to 15s or even eights where you're probably going to be sailing at eight, spending in for 80%, right? The inverse is true. Like if you're living all day at 12 to 20s, and and time under tensions and holds and isometrics, like you're going to do way there. And this is this is not fiber type at all. This is straight up specificity. This is a hundred percent specificity. <laughs> like there's not that. So it is not to say that that test is just total garbage. It's but it is like you, you are gonna find out, man. I can tell you that right now. Like training partners all about I'm I'm I know myself personally, I'm very fast twitch. And I know this from all of the like on the field stuff as well as the biopsies are going to have a ton of them. There's no right. risk taking my fiber type profile. It's very, very fast, right? And everyone that I've ever done that's in the opposite of the spectrum, like it, it's it's very clear that, that it, it, it passes the smell test, right? Like you, you're never going to see, see me cranking out 15 reps at 80%, like under any circumstance, as, as fit as I've ever been. Like it's just never going to happen, right? But I will for sure be smashing 80% on my sixth rep way faster than other people's second rep. Like way faster, right? I just, I just do like it's, it's absurd, right? Relative to my own self, like I'm, I'm not going to slow down until it's zero. I don't know. It kind of lines up. It's not the worst thing that ever, but um, I appreciate that pushback. And then it's just hey. a question of does that only represent your fiber type, or also the training history, and is that useful to then program? Well, and I think that's your training the least. I guess that's the way exactly. I would say it. I'd say it's yeah. mostly your training history. Um, also, it's stacked with me as well because mostly my training history is weightlifting. Yep. It's not that, it's foul. It, it's those types of things. So um, what I would say is, is to wrap up. I'd say it doesn't mean it's useless, but whether I would go then and make a big percentage of my training decisions based on something like that, no. Some informed, maybe, part of the equation, sure, but like, this is what I do now because of that, no chance. And I would say the same thing about, I would go even further with genetics and stuff like that. Like, I'm not making any training decisions based on any of that garbage. This one is a little bit closer, but we're not all the way up. Eric, do you have five minutes to go a little further? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because, Andy, then you mentioned before the question the first has T City, has Brian Ortega had a muscle biopsy done by yourself? No. Oh, I'm going to say 75% confidence. I don't think I have. Sure. Uh, the the reason why I asked that jokingly, you just spoke about kind of muscle fibers. If you know uh, someone's kind of split and what category they're in, the choices uh, as you as a coach, you spoke at the beginning, however, at the top shelf athletes across a wide variety of, uh, you know, different sports that you do uh, uh, coach. What are then some of the key choices that you make in terms of determining either uh, their training, nutrition, all, all the encompassing details? What are the big bucket items that you look at then? Uh, if obviously this potentially can only play, let's say maybe a small role in any choices you make. So what as a coach then is shifting kind of, you went from, uh, science to then your businesses application now. So now we're talking application with clients. What do you look for then? I do not have five minutes to just get that. <laughs> this is, that was exactly my thought. That's 25 not a five minute minutes. question. The next one, Andy, maybe what we'll do is we'll bring you back. Here, here's what I'll yeah. say. Yeah. Um, the way that we coach. You guys can can probably tell by now. Um, I don't like to go and do things small. Yep. So the way that our systems operate, our our executive coaching program and all of our athletes is, I believe, fully and extremely detailed and incredibly complicated 
analysis so that we can provide very specific and high precision solution. So what that means is we go absolutely over the top with our testing. Like absurd. We take well over 500 biomarkers. We take a ton and ton and ton of blood and urine and we take some stool and saliva and sometimes hair and we take sweat. We have really advanced analytics on what goes on your body. So I want to, everything goes on your body and in your body. We want to then see how that all is processed. So we're going to take all that stuff from there. And then I want to see everything that comes out your body. Everything that comes out your body is how you look, how you feel, how you perform. So we're going to do a bunch of that testing. We're doing performance testing on them. Everything from breath related testing to psychological evaluation to VO2 max testing or DEXA scans or whatever would be there to ocular metrics. So as an example, one of the things that is very clear is any elite baseball players, up to 70% of the variance in batting performance is measured by ocular metrics. And so like if we're working with a baseball player, like we're like ocular metrics are going to be very, very important, right? Where if we're working with a, a basketball player, it's not at eyes are important, but it's not as big a deal. So that person would get that. We're doing incredibly in-depth sleep analysis. So we're running full clinical grade sleep studies on people uh, in their own house, in their own bedroom every single night. We're running full uh, atmosphere evaluations. So, so we're looking at everything in the environment and the air and the quality and all the organics coming out of the mattress or wall, anything like that that's happening. All that data, uh, all those data are coming in. Uh, we're running a full movement analysis on people. We're getting all that stuff. From there, everything gets combined together. We take a look at it all, and we try to find what we call their performance anchors. So what are like the two to four things that are driving any of the lack of how they look, feel, or perform, right? So if they're not looking, feeling, performing the way we want them to or the way they want to, then we're trying to figure out why. And we're going to find those couple of things. And then we're going to deploy very specific solutions to correct those things. And then from there, get out of physiology's way. Um, and so our stuff is, uh, it, it's, it's not the like, hey, here's a questionnaire and, and like, you know, through your, well, here's your blood pressure or something like that. It, it, it's, it's quite in depth. So we can provide very specific solutions uh, and the technology and, and stuff that we have for both the sleep stuff, the blood work stuff. It's, um, again, you, you guys, I'm not short on confidence here. But it, it's it's pretty next level stuff. So um, it, the reality is, like again, not sounds super arrogant as possible here, but um, I'm not working with like when I say pro athletes, I'm not working with like it's the people you see on Sports Center every day. It's the people like that are making fifty to eighty million dollars a year. Like I don't have time, and they don't have time, and we're not going to like send them an order ring. I guess that's that's, that's not fifty million dollar athlete style. Like yeah. it's it's a little bit different. Um, so we're not working with like, oh yeah, I ran some races this weekend. They did my first, those are not the athletes I'm talking about. No offense to that. I don't, I don't mean to meet anybody, but just more concepts. Like when you ask a question like that, I'm like, I, I can't do that in five minutes. And because there's a lot that goes on when we have a little bit of resources, basically, uh, a lot of these folks. So that's, that's the, the quick answer there. Andy, we would love to have you back on. I feel in a few years, however, you just, you have now five companies. You're probably going to have 10 we're going to need to talk to your assistant, to the secretary, to Andy, to even see if we could get you back on to discuss that. Well, I hear the reality of it is that, that that's what happens now. You, you yep. guys get the free pass at the front of the line, though. So dang, the early homie hookup. We appreciate it, man. Well, Andy, I, we're we're going we're going to want to know all that information for myself and Eric because we have like a local strongman competition in 2024. We need the major advantages. Yeah, there's what a. Bro, there's LeBron. I want a podium yeah, yeah. at the local local competition. It's, yeah, and, and help I, uh, us. Local it's competition. It's going to be hard to give me the third. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I don't think we could emotionally be satisfied with anything less than first at our local competition, Andy. So come on, man. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Like, I, I kind of feel bad about how I just said this up. Like, I really, I don't want, like, you guys to, uh, I'm not a big time running like that. It's, it's not that those folks are better or any different. It's just, like, those those are different levels to play on uh, that we have to play. So, I'll love to everybody competing at all of your levels. I love it all too. I still work with, we have a handful of folks in her, uh, much lower level, just because like, that, that's what my honest passion is. That's where I start and always want to be. Um, but the last, you know, five to eight years or so, it's, it's been more of the, yo, we got to win a world title, whatever. Like, what do you want to do? And a lot of, it's just allowed us to do some really cool things scientifically that I would have never had the funds to do or opportunities to do in the areas that I'm more passionate about. So um, I, I felt like, I just kind of felt bad saying it the way I said. So I don't want that to come off no. the way. 
That's fully understood. You're discussing that, you know, the methodologies in science are constrained to the kind of money that's in your typical exercise science lab, which is a typically a four to five digit number. And the, 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 or three. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's a successful lab I was talking about. You get, they got the NSCA international grant pro. Yeah. Um, 40 grand. Yeah. And the, the kind of money you're talking about is just a, it's still 40. It's just a different number afterwards. It's not grand, it's a million. And when you do that, and when there's that much investment, it enables people to really see how much can be leveraged. And I think that's to some degree, a very encouraging thing, because I think there is some science nihilism going on right now. Like, yeah. what can this even tell us? And I think it's sometimes helpful to be aware of the constraints and how slow this build is, and that if we did invest more into science, we would have answers a lot faster. And where the, in, in the areas where we do invest more science, we do get answers a lot faster. Yeah, I think that that's a very true statement. Um, there... The, the reality of it is being behind the curtain of these high profile folks, there are still some that I'm like, man, if he just stopped eating Popeye's chicken every day, like Thanks. that, that's a real thing. Yeah, that's a know. very, very, very real thing. It's also what I talked about. It's a real thing too, where it's like, yo, um, we worked with an NBA team and I'm going to have to dance around this quite a bit. And I'll just say the decision they had to make on math late, uh, was going to have about a $400 million impact on that franchise. So, like... Large consequences. If you think that kind of money is on the line, um, then there are definitely better solutions and there are better tools and things like that there. So, um, I, I think both those sides of the equation are, are, are true. And yeah, Eric, I didn't even tell them, man, like, the more that you do putting those $5,000, $10,000 things, um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've cited your stuff in these conversations. No question, right? Even just this, the, the uh, study you finally just had come out about overfeeding. Uh, I mean, I brought that up a bunch. I'm like, damn, God, Eric, come on, let's go get something else. Like, I've said that so many times. Like, you know, you know. Um, so, like, that stuff matters. It, it all matters because it feeds up. And all those people, those highest levels, they don't know your name per se, but they're asking me, I saw that study of this and this. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, it all does matter. No question. I appreciate that, man. It's a very valuable perspective, and I thank you for giving us the time. I think you have some very unique insight um, in a specific area, but then you've also applied it across a lot of different domains. So uh, I know the listeners, anyone who's interested in deep science, are going to be very engaged with this episode. So thank you very much. Andy, where can people find you? The internet, man. Just the I'm internet. All over this. <laughs> <laughs> I control the internet. Well, now we actually, the one upgrade we have, uh, shout out to Eric student, Kai Homer, for the timestamps that will be linked below, as well as the links in the description of all relevant details for yourself. I will say in closing, uh, Andy, if there's one person I would allow to stab a pen-like object, a pen-sized uh, object into my thigh for a muscle biopsy, you'd be my number one choice. No, Mike Roberts is your guy. Mike, oh, we know Mike Roberts. Is he, what, he's more gentle? Or are you just more experienced? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Probably he, he probably has some, although he doesn't really care about your Philly either. So damn, I think he yeah, some cold ass researchers. Omar, These researchers, but you know what? at least he's honest. At least you're honest. We got some full dexters here. Well, I want to thank everyone for listening to another episode of Iron Culture. You could go ahead and leave a rating or review on iTunes. It does help us out. Typically, people will give a rating of five stars. But again, it's up to your own discretion. We sometimes like reading the one-star reviews. We're back every single insert date here, and we'll catch you in that next episode.